Today we'll be talking about Oceania. We're going to start with a listening example featuring one of the most famous instruments from this part of the world, the didgeridoo. <laughs> We'll leave that example in the background as we talk a little bit about this region. Oceania includes Australia and Hawaii and Tahiti, three places we're going to be talking about. Australia is the big island to your lower left. Hawaii is all the way in the top right corner. Tahiti is right in between the two of them. It includes New Zealand, Polynesia, New Guinea. And this area is inhabited by 25,000 islands. 1,200 different languages are spoken. English and French are common because those were the colonial powers that occupied this area. And there's a combination of different kinds of religions, animism, totemism, Christianity. We'll be talking about animism later. The most important musical aspect is that a lot of the uh, music is primarily vocal music, particularly choirs. And they use different kinds of techniques and timbres than you might be, interest, uh, might be familiar with with your experience with our Western choirs. Men and women have very different roles in the music. Uh, they have separate ceremonies, separate roles in the culture, uh, separate roles in music, and men and women have very separate music. So when ethnomusicologists came here, it was largely male ethnomusicologists, and um, a lot of the famous music tends to be more male music, but women have just as much music. And luckily, a lot of that's being explored now. So don't get the idea that uh, women don't have music. They have just as much music as men. It just hasn't been as studied and documented. Um, we're going to see an exception to that today as well, though. So Westerners had a big impact on the area, especially missionaries. And in this area, music is connected to creation and nature. And again, that idea, animism, is a religion that uh, is based on the idea that great spirit resides in everything natural. Not only do people have spirits, but animals have spirits. Rocks, plant, air, fire, mountains, streams, rivers, soil, everything has spirit. And if you honor that spirit, uh, then the things you need to survive will come to you. And you honor that spirit through prayer. And, as is the case with a lot of cultures, they pray through music. So music, religion, and nature, I like to say, are inextricably linked. Think of them as a triangle. And think of music right over here, religion here, and nature here. That's a funky triangle. And uh, all three of them are connected. You don't have music without nature. You don't have religion without honoring nature. And you don't have religion without using music to pray. Idiophones and membranophones are the most common classification. But you also find some very uh, well-known aerophones, such as the didgeridoo, which we just heard. And uh, later on in the history, with the advent and arrival of Westerners, you find some stringed instruments, some chordophones, uh, of which the most famous is the ukulele. So again, primarily vocal music in this area different kinds of techniques than you might be interested so or then you might be familiar with so let's talk a little bit more about Australia and the Aboriginal song you just heard with the didgeridoo uh, Australia has a, a large uh, open area called the outback or bush and you can see what it looks like in that photo there and the Aboriginal people have been in this area for 40,000 years they have a nomadic lifestyle going from place to place wherever they need uh, uh, based on the time of year to be able to survive best. 
And don't think of the Aboriginal people as being homogeneous. There's actually 400 distinct subcultures within the Aboriginal people, yet they're only 1% of the population. And note the little cute koala bear over there. I'll be talking about koalas in a little while when I talk, uh, tell you guys a little story. So, first impressions of the music we heard was sort of a low rumble plus a banging sound in the background. That photo shows a picture of the didgeridoo right in between a singer and a clapstick player. The didgeridoo is a trumpet. It's an aerophone within the trumpet family. So classification, aerophone, down below among the various trumpet type instruments which buzz with the lips, uh, didgeridoo is one of them in addition to our trumpet, trombone, tuba, etc. The clapsticks are just two sticks hit together. They can be boomerangs um, that you clap together. And the vocalist is also a storyteller. The uh, text and the things that uh, Aboriginal people often sing about are history songs. Uh, collectively, their collection of history songs are called Dream Time. This is basically their Bible slash history book. And they describe creation, they regenerate the culture, and common contexts for Dream Time songs are funerals, coming of age ceremonies, and dance is often included in these stories. Didgeridoo is not played by women and it has a lot of power. It can imitate animals such as dogs and hornets. Uh, it can imitate, uh, imitate nature, uh, for instance water. This is a nighttime ceremony with a didgeridoo. And I think before I move on I'm going to tell you a little story. And again, dream time is the history book slash whole creation stories uh, of the um, Aboriginal people. So, the story that I am going to tell you is called Ilawara and the Five Islands. And it has three characters. Let's just cut to the chase and call them Koala, Starfish, and Whale. So, once upon a time, there was Whale, Starfish, and Koala on an island, not too far from the mainland. And koala and starfish were getting bored of being on this island. They wanted to go to the mainland and eat some different foods and walk around, but they couldn't get there because it was too far to swim. Whale had a boat, but whale didn't want to share the boat. Koala and starfish asked whale many times, hey, let's take that boat over to the mainland. Let's go have some fun, let's go do some different stuff, let's go eat different kinds of food. Whale said, no, I'm happy here. Here I'm going to stay. And Whale protected his boat very jealously. Whale was always on the ground, sort of putting his, his, uh, his fin around the whale so that nobody could steal it. So Koala hatched a plan. He told Starfish, hey, Whale likes me to get on his back and scratch his back right near his blowhole and clean all the insects off and when I'm doing that for Whale, he gets really relaxed and he falls asleep. That's the time to steal his boat. So, the next time that Koala was on Whale's back, scratching his back, Whale fell asleep. And at that time, Starfish was able to take the boat and slide it out from underneath Whale's fin while he was deep, deep asleep. Starfish took the boat out to the shore, started paddling. When... Koala was sure that Whale was fast asleep. He sneaked away, swam out to where Starfish was paddling the boat, and off they went toward the mainland. Everything was going pretty well for a little while. Starfish and Koala had gotten about two-thirds of the way to the mainland when Whale woke up and he was mad because he noticed right away that his boat was gone. So Whale got into the ocean and started swimmer, swimming. And whales are strong swimmers, as you guys know. So he was catching up to starfish and koala. They were paddling like mad. They were just about to the shore when whale caught up to them and did what whales do. Went down and up and came up and smashed right onto the boat. Broke it into five different pieces. These days, if you go to Australia, right off the shore, there are five islands called the Ilawara Islands. That is what's left of that boat. And he caught up to starfish, pulled him this way, that way, this way, that way, that way, threw him against a rock, 
smashed him right against the rock. And if you go to the shore, you'll still see starfish plastered against a rock today. Koala he caught up to as well, pulled his ears this way and that way, smashed him right in the face, flattened his whole face, especially his nose, and koala scampered up to a eucalyptus tree and is shivering up there in the tree still today. And if you go off to the coast, even here in California, you might see whales going up and down, going up and down the coast. And a lot of people saying they're going to go up and down to mate and find a mate. But people that know better know that whale is still searching up and down the coast to find starfish and koala to give them another good flogging. That is an example of a Dreamtime story. And as you guys can see, not only does it explain a lot about geography, biology, nature, animals, their characteristics, why they are the way they are, um, but it also is done in a humorous kind of way as well, as, uh, in a very memorable way. So uh, hopefully you'll remember that story. Uh, there will be a question about that on the exam. So that is Australia. And let's talk about some connections to the West. Um, there are many bands that use uh, didgeridoo and talk about aboriginal issues. Uh, the best known rock band is called Midnight Oil. If you haven't had a chance to check them out, you probably already know a few of their songs. I'm going to focus on Yothu Yindi, which is a more traditional um, aboriginal group that talks about aboriginal issues. They have some of the same issues that Native Americans have here uh, in that they've been pushed continually off their land and uh, their rights have been impinged upon by the majority population. So let's listen to a little bit of a song called Timeless Land on YouTube so that you can hear and see a little bit of this band. So in that video, he's singing, this is the promised land, this is our land. The didgeridoo has also been used in a lot of Western music. And I like to show this example here of an electronic didgeridoo to show you what's capable of this instrument. In this example, he's using a didgeridoo as a controller for a bunch of synthesizers and boxes. So check this out.
singer in that example or the player in that example is using a uh, using a circular breathing technique to create a constant sound. Uh, let me show you another example of a didgeridoo player and show what is capable with the didgeridoo and all the different sounds he can make from it. And I'll include the link for this in the description. You've seen a couple of didgeridoo, scrape all the bark back, and here's the finished product. Paint it as well with tomato. The didgeridoo is one of the world's oldest wind instruments. And what's so unique about the didgeridoo is that it doesn't have a reed, it doesn't have finger holes, it's up to you to do the sound, to produce the twangs with your tongue, with your lips, and do the sounds in your voice box. I can show you how to play the didgeridoo, but it's up to you to put the time and effort into practicing every day, one hour, two hours, to play it and so forth. Now, to play the didgeridoo, you've got to do a sharp raspberry. Don't blow like a trumpet because it's not a brass instrument, it's timber. This is what it sounds like. If you blow it hard like a trumpet, it sounds pretty terrible. Blow softly. Try and do some twangs also with your tongue. Now the voice box is there for its purpose also. You do sounds like the dingoes, pugaburras, mopokes, emus, and you can do sounds that are produced through the didgeridoo. And the sound is synthesized. Now the sound is also inside of all the little cracks and holes and termites that are left behind. That's what also synthesizes the sound. It doesn't sound very good at this end, but at that end, it sounds very good. So, for example, the dingo, that's the wild dog, gun and bark the cow. You've got to do the sound in your voice box. Try the voice, but vibrate it at the same time. To do a dingo, for example, do five short calls and one big long one. That link is playing a ditchery dude, David Hudson. He's great, isn't he? So check out the whole thing, because there's going to be other things that I might ask you about the didgeridoo uh, based on that listening example. It especially is really good about telling you all the different kinds of uh, things that it could imitate, for instance, just right here, a dingo dog. All right, let's continue on and make our next stop in this part of the world. So we will continue and go to Hawaii where we are going to be exploring music that you've probably heard about, drum, dance, chant. Sometimes people know that as hula. Hula is just the dance part of it. Hawaii is the northernmost island of Polynesia. It was first visited by, um, of, in terms of Westerners, by Captain James Cook in 1778. Uh, some very famous monarchs, uh, King Kamehameha the first and second, and Queen Liliokalani, uh, around the turn of the past century. She was a musician. She wrote the Hawaii state song called Aloha Oe. <laughs> Harbor in Hawaii was bombed by the Japanese on December 7th, 1941, uh, which was the act that brought the United States into World War II against not only the Japanese, but also the Germans and the Italians. And in 1959, Hawaii became our 
last and 50th state. First impressions of uh, the drum and dance champs. So the didgeridoo we listened to a little while ago was CD1, example one. The drum and dance champ from Hawaii is CD1, example two. CD1, example two. Here it is. Listen to the whole example on your own. First impressions, a wavy chant-like voice, earthy sounding drums, full voice. Uh, you can't see it now, but we'll see a video in a little while that shows body movements that go along with this drum and dance chant. Uh, it's, for the most part, seems well rehearsed, and there is a lot of respect, as you'll see in the video, paid not only to elders, but also to women. So, let's play a similar example of a drum and dance chant. And this one is, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it in a few seconds after we listen to it. chant is called the Hulupa Ipu, and these are Hawaiian dance songs performed in conjunction with one or more gourd idiophones called Ipu. Also drums are common, like in the example that we heard in our CD. This is originally part of a long myth about Pele, the goddess of fire and volcanoes, and her sister Hiiaka. This dance song is still performed at the edge of a volcano in honor of Pele as an, and as an expression of Hawaiian identity. Um, the male and female dancers perform the same movements in the dramatic choreography, characteristic of traditions that you still find in Hawaii today. The hand and arm movements allude to words of the text, while the lower body movement, uh, movements keep the rhythm with an emphasis on circular hip mo uh, movement. The red clothing symbolizes Pele's volcanic nature and is based on traditional costumes used by musicians and on women's hula attire of the 19th century. All right. So you've seen a little bit of this, and you probably might have noticed already that women play a really important role as singers, as dancers, as musicians, and as keeper of history. So here's one of those traditions that sort of play against some of the stereotypes that we've already established about much of this being men's music. Uh, this is definitely, uh, um, the, the, the presence of women here definitely symbolizes their importance and power in society. So, 
In the listening example we have on our CD, you have two different drums, both membranophones, the small kilu on the left and the pahu on the right. The singing has a very wide vibrato and sliding uh, type of singing with that sliding, which is called portamento. Very open-ended vowels, so a lot of vowels, not too many consonants. Uh, very beautiful language to sing and to listen to. Uh, the components of the example are mele, which is the poetry, the text, and hula, which is the dance. The pahu drum is considered sacred. It is believed that the pahu drum speaks to the gods. The pahu drum speaks to the gods. The pahu drum speaks to the gods. Functions include history, prayers, weddings, and funerals. Connections to the West. The impact of missionaries and Westerners uh, brought a lot of changes to this music. And um, they restricted the music and the dance, which was problematic because this is basically the history book of the Hawaiian peoples. Uh, so it's like burning down a library. Luckily, a lot of the uh, Hawaiians still kept performing the hula and this kind of music in secret, but most people would probably guess that about 90% of their history was lost in that transition when the Westerners and the uh, missionaries came. Uh, missionaries brought instruments and brought harmony to this area. Uh, previously, the music had been mostly monophonic. And there's some pretty famous music that has been created as a result. Uh, the ukulele is the most well-known stringed instrument that comes from Hawaii. Uh, it was probably based on uh, guitars brought by Portuguese or vihuelas brought by Mexican uh, workers. The vihuela is that small guitar instrument that you've probably seen in mariachi music. So let's listen to a little bit of uh, ukulele music by the Hupi'i brothers. And the uh, link is right there. That'll be followed by a very, very, very famous song done by uh, the great uh, Israel Kamakawioele. And he passed away not too many years ago. And you probably heard this example of uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which I think was used in one of the recent movies in the 2000s. I can't remember when. So first, let's check out the Huwupi brothers and listen for their wonderful, wonderful falsetto singing. This example is called Koopa Landing.
heard this before as well. example CD1 number three from Tahiti Tahitian vocal music we will end with this uh, in this example you'll hear some striking modulations uh, between keys and this music is sung for transitions uh, it is music that you hear in the womb uh, before you're born it is music you hear when you die and the it is believed that the uh, modulations serve as a bridge between the worlds and this music as well was somewhat influenced by Christian missionaries, um, but uh, this kind of Tahitian vocal music uh, predates the arrival of missionaries and the harmonies predate the arrival of missionaries. So there has been some um, influence, but the example I'm gonna play right now probably has very, very little, if no, Western influence. This is the way that Tahitian people have sung for uh, these kinds of transitions since the beginning of time. So let's listen to CD1, example three. This has been Music 307 Oceania, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I will see you in class.
You know, the Polynesian voyages were undoubtedly the greatest sailors and navigators the world has ever seen. And um, before they sail, they always called on Tangaloa, God of the Sea, um, for safe passage to, um, to finding their new home. This is Tulo, Tangalo.
Viva! 